Please turn to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 13. 1 Samuel, chapter 13. This is the, <clears throat> I say this is the highest point of our time of worship. Whenever we read the word of God, how precious it is that it is the most precious moment in our time of worship because we get to hear from God. We, as we read these sacred passages, God is speaking to us. And so I will ask us to, as we read, and as, uh, or rather as I read, and as we look at this passage that our hearts will be lifted up to God. 1 Samuel chapter 13. So lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it and said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. And the Philistine mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots, and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand of the seashore in the multitude. They came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad. And Gilead. Saul was still in Gilgal, and all the people <coughs> sorry, followed him trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me, and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings, offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. And I <coughs> have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord, your God, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord will have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. For the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Samuel arose and went up to Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the people who were present with them stayed in Geba of Benjamin. But uh, the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And the raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned toward Ophrah to the north land of Shual. Another company turned toward Beth Horon. And another company turned toward the border that looks down on the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. 
Now there were no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make themselves swords or spears. But every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his sickle. And the charge was two third of a shekel for the plowshare and for the mattock, and a third of a shekel for sharpening the axe and for setting the gods. So on the day of battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people with Saul and Jonathan. But Saul and Jonathan, his son, had them. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to pass uh, to the pass of Michmash. Let us ask the Lord one more time for his help. Oh Lord, we seek your help again as we look at your word. Help us to understand it. Help us to comprehend the truths hidden in it. May your spirit enlighten us for we cannot understand these truths without the help of the Holy Spirit. Teach us, O Lord. Strengthen me, help me to be faithful, to be clear, to be simple. As I bring forth your word, may I not add to it, may I not subtract to it, O Lord. And O Lord, at the end of the day, may I decrease and may you be exalted even over this pulpit this evening, O Lord. For we pray and ask this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Um, one, of, one of the things that can really make you see how terrible a product is, is when a product fails after its launch or it fails during its launch. Um, you can imagine, for example, you, you are launching um, a new shoe, shoe wear, let's say. And uh, immediately that shoe, maybe you have uh, people sitting in an auditorium and you have a model wearing that shoe. And immediately that model steps on stage, that shoe tears. And the sole and the, the, the shoe are separated at the launch. You can imagine how embarrassing that would be and how the people who are watching that would think, Ay, there is a fundamental problem with that product. You know, that is a common thing that there are some products which fail or they have issues from the very moment they are launched. Um, and in the same way, or rather in a much more serious way, we have just seen the kingdom of Saul being launched in chapter 12, chapter 11 and 12. This is the inauguration of the kingdom. We see the splendor and we see all the wonderful speeches made about this new coming kingdom. But then, after this kingdom is launched, chapter 13 shows us the sad reality that there is a fundamental problem with this product. God exposes the real problem with the kingdom of men or the kingship of men. Remember that Israel had rejected God. They had said that we don't want God to be our king. We want to be like the other nations and have a human king on the throne. But once this kingdom is launched and this product is paraded, you have your new king, you have a new kingdom, we see a failure of the product when it is put on the runway, when it is put on uh, the display shelves. And here in this passage, we see that a kingdom that seemed to be ascending is actually a kingdom on spiritual decline. As soon as this kingdom of soul had launched, it crashed or it started making, 
its way down. It started to nose dive. It was about to crash and burn. And even as we look at this reality this evening of how a kingdom can just launch and immediately after the launch it's going south, it should help us to look at our own selves and look at our own spiritual lives and our own spiritual walks. We need to ask ourselves a number of things that this text will ask us or it will point to us or it will make us to consider whether we are entertaining some of those things that caused this kingdom to nose dive and to decline spiritually. That as your spiritual life seems to be going up, is there a danger that it could nose dive, that it could crash and burn? Well, this kingdom found itself there, and let's learn from it. So we will see an, uh, just three things that reveal why this kingdom of Saul that had quickly come up was now quickly on the descent. Like, you don't even, I mean, <clears throat> you, you don't even see the kingdom, first of all, having successes, and then afterwards having a decline. It's the kingdom is launched, and then chapter 14, the kingdom is going south. What has caused this sharp, sharp uh, change in things? Well, we shall see that first of all, there was the danger of ease with the enemy around them and the enemy within them. We are told, for example, that there was a garrison of the Philistines at Gibeah, right? Or at Geba. And we see this, for example, in uh, verse 3, which uh, this garrison is defeated. But then you need to ask yourself this question. What was a garrison of the Philistines doing there? Why were the Philistines still around and bothering them? Even though God had commanded them to extinguish these people, this is their first, or rather the first problem with the kingdom of Saul. The, verse, the beginning verse of this chapter is a bit controversial. It has... Uh, numbers or uh, years that cannot uh, be figured out by many. People say it as a grammatical error, but we know that providentially some of the numbers there are lost. But what is not debated and what cannot be debated is the situation that Israel was under in the early parts of Saul's reign. What cannot be debated, what we cannot sit down and say, well, we don't know, uh, let's sit down and debate this. It is the situation in the kingdom of Saul. We see that Israel was under the danger of an enemy that was within and without of its borders. We see a, a nation with a garrison of Philistines at Geba. Now, Geba was a few kilometers between Ramah, and if, if you have been here when we began looking at the book of 1 Samuel, you will notice that Ramah is very prominent. And Mikmash is another very important city. And Geba was right in the middle of these two important and strategic cities. Geba had a Philistine garrison, and we see this there in this passage. We also see it during the anointing of Saul, where we are told in, um, in chapter 10 and verse, 
verse 5. After that, you shall come to Gibeah Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. So there was a garrison of the Philistines. Smack in the middle of the kingdom. And you ask yourself, it's like in Kenya, you have a garrison of uh, an, an enemy country between Mombasa and Nairobi. You have soldiers garrisoned there who hate your country. And they are living there, they are being supplied, and no one is doing anything about it. This garrison was used by the Philistines to ensure that should they attack, they would have a ready uh, army to supply them or to assist them. And the situation, what we would think is that with a king now installed in Israel, such a garrison would not be allowed to operate. But sadly, it continues to operate. It continues to operate years into Saul's reign, whether it was two years, three years, ten years. How is it that this king was on the throne? How is it that this king moved from one town to another saw that garrison and did nothing about it. Enemy soldiers with a whole entire barracks inside your border and no one, and especially the king, is doing nothing about it. This kind of ease showed the dangerous situation that Israel was in. And it actually, even when this garrison is attacked, it takes the initiative of who to attack this garrison. Is it the king? Is it the newly installed king of Israel, Saul? No, it is his son, Jonathan. It takes Jonathan, Saul's son, to initiate an attack on this garrison. And this begs the question, where was the king? And why didn't he initiate this attack? Because, <coughs> remember, we are told in the beginning of verse of chapter 13 that Israel had 3,000 men of war. The king Saul had 2,000 men. Jonathan had 1,000. And it is this one who has 1,000 soldiers, who takes that initiative? While the man who has 2,000 soldiers is somewhere with the army. The king, Saul, had allowed the Philistines to be within the borders for too long. They had grown in strength. They had grown in power. We must remember that God had commanded in his word that Israel shall, cannot or should not allow the Canaanite nations. That Israel was commanded to destroy them. And we see this, for example, in Exodus 23 and verse 33, that God had commanded way before Saul had been installed as the king. And remember that when Saul was installed as the king of, of Israel, he was given these laws before he was anointed. He was given the laws. He should have read the law, and he should have seen a passage like Exodus, a passage like Exodus 23 and verse 33. They shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. Right? So God had said in many places, do not allow them to dwell in your land. Do not allow them within the land that I have promised you. Do not allow, allow them inside your borders. And there, 
is a garrison of the Philistines. And the king is doing nothing about it. His son is the one who initiates this attack. For more than a year, the king and the whole nation did not obey the commandment or this commandment of God. And this gave the Philistines time to grow and to prepare for war and to weaken and to disarm the Israelites. We see that this, the result is that the army that comes against Israel is a very powerful army. If you compare the army that fought Eli's sons in, um, is it chapter 4? Chapter 5 and chapter 6. This is a very different army. This is an army that has grown. We are told and they mustered what? 30,000 chariots. Where did they get the time to grow? In building such an army. In building chariots. Where did they get the time of having 6,000 horsemen? Probably buying horses from other people or getting them from somewhere. It is because Israel was at ease. Israel was okay with the Philistines. Let's not rock the boat. Let's not start uh, fighting the Philistines. Even though God has commanded it, maybe let's just give it some more time. But the more time they gave to their enemies, the stronger they became, the more powerful they became. And by the way, isn't this also the same thing that happens in our own lives? That the longer you ignore the commands of God, the stronger a sin that you are entertaining grows strong, isn't it? The more you delay to deal with a sin, the more you are at ease with a certain situation. You know that this issue or this situation might put you into temptation to sin. The longer you allow it to be there, it is growing stronger. It is growing much more powerful. How many times are those when your pet sin or simply acute sin, fuzzy, looking good, fluffy, but then after some time it has become a monster with sharp teeth, big claws, and a hunger that cannot be satisfied. We must not be at ease with those things that God has commanded us. Finish off, take away, remove, flee from them. We cannot be at ease with them. This is the situation that Israel was in. They were walking in disobedience. They did not, or the king did not seek to attack the Philistines. When we walk in disobedience, when we do not, when we do not advance in our spiritual lives, when we do not pray, when we do not love one another, we weaken ourselves and we allow the enemy within and without, to grow strong. That's a dangerous thing, to be at ease with an enemy, to allow a whole garrison. Saul, you are a whole king. You have 2,000 men. What is that garrison doing there? It is only giving time. It is giving the Philistines a foothold to grow and to be strong. This is the danger. And this is why then, there is a sharp decline. It, we, in medically, it's described as a congenital problem. The, the kingdom had a problem from the time it was birthed. But here was a king who was 
not ready, not willing to do his work. But then secondly, we see that there is another issue. So they are not only in danger, or rather the decline is not only brought about by the danger of them being at ease with their enemy, within and without, but there is also the danger of presumption and pride. This kingdom is in big danger. We are told here that this young kingdom of Saul would suffer a mortal and self-inflicted wound. This kingdom that had just been launched, I mean, it's a sad thing. It's a kingdom that hadn't even been, uh, been there for long. But yet, it has a mortal wound, and a mortal wound that is self-inflicted. His kingship and the nation are now in great danger due to the sin of pride and presumption. And we see this in verses 18, 8 to 18, where we are told about Saul seeking to sacrifice, or rather he decides to sacrifice, to make an offering, and he knew that's not his work. It is important that we see this sin, the development of this sin, that with the defeat of the Philistines in uh, the Philistine garrison, Saul makes it known to all Israel that he had defeated the Philistines and not Jonathan, right? We see that. He doesn't say that it is Jonathan who has defeated. Okay, he, he says, you know, um, and verse 4, and all Israel had it said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines, which was not the case. So, Saul was taking on glory that was not his. Saul was quick to accept this or the, the political benefits of this defeat without having done the work. He wanted to enjoy the blessings of victory without being part of it. And we see that Saul then gathers all the nation for war. But he gathered the, he, he gathered, gathers the people for war without calling for national prayers or consulting Samuel. So that's another mistake. So we see one sin leading to another sin, to another sin, and eventually to a very big sin. That first of all, let it be known that it is Saul who was defeated. So taking glory, but then the next thing is that with that victory, he decides, okay, let me take the next initiative. Let me now gather the people for war. But the custom was that before going to war, that the people of Israel would always go to who? To Samuel. They would always go to Samuel and ask Samuel, please, what is the will of God? Or they would at least pray. This is the, what is set out for them, at least in the defeat of the Ammonites. That Samuel plays an important role in the defeat of the, Philist, uh, of the Ammonites in chapter 11. Such that, you know, the people actually uh, view this victory as a victory of Samuel and Saul. But then, 
When Saul decides to go to war, no prayers. No consulting the word of God. That's a serious, serious sin of pride. That's serious presumption. You think that because you are the king, God will be with you? That's some serious presumption. And now we might read this and think, wow, why would Saul do, do that? But don't we also do that in one way or another? That we make these big decisions in our lives. We make these big decisions as families without even prayer, without even taking time to just say, let's pray, let's, let's seek the Lord. Let's ask the Lord which is the best way. Let's ask the Lord to give us wisdom. That was a serious, serious sin. But then to add on to this, we are told that Saul goes to Gilgal and with the news that the Philistines are gathering and that the people are scattering, Saul is anxious. And he now suddenly remembers Samuel and wants a sacrifice to be made. So when things are now getting into trouble, when before he gathered the people, he didn't see the need to, for prayer. But now that he has gathered the people and the people have heard that, wait a minute, the Philistine army has many chariots. And chariots, by the way, those days were like the modern day tanks. You are going to fight an enemy with chariots. Then he decides, oh, I think we need to pray. But then if you look at this passage and how the author puts it, the reason why he seeks after God and seeks after Samuel is not really because now he wants to be sorted with God. It's rather he has noticed what? That the people are scattering. Right? And this is what we see, that in verse 7, verse 6 and 7, the people are hiding. The army that he had, people are hiding in caves, in holes, in rocks, in tombs. What kind of fear was this, that even people are hiding in tombs? And Saul is there waiting for Samuel to come. And in verse 8, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattering from him. And because the people were scattering from him, verse 9, so Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. Saul makes a tragic mistake. He makes a tragic, commits a tragic sin. He decides that to appease the people, to keep his army together, let me do this religious thing so that the people may know that God is with us. With the delay of Samuel, Saul will take matters into his own hands. And he will sacrifice. As one commentator puts it, one commentator puts it this way, that the sacrificial rituals or ritual was essential to Saul, but the prophetic instruction was dispensable. In other words, he wanted the ritual without the instruction. He looked at the sacrifice and the offering simply as a ritual that I need without the commandment, without the instruction of the prophet. Because these two are connected. 
The sacrificial system is connected with the word of God, with the law of God, isn't it? Did God give a separate book for sacrifices and then a separate book for laws to be kept? Did he do that? They are all found in the same scripture. Why? They are connected. They are both important. That for you to take one, you must take the other. Samuel now confronts Saul. And he confronts him by asking him a question. We are told as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Samuel, verse 11, said, What have you done? This, is a, this question is the same question that someone else was asked. Do you remember who was asked the same question? A similar question, where are you, Adam, right? Such questions in the Bible, when you look at such questions, they are not questions where the one who is asking wants to gain information. When God asked Adam, where are you? God already knew where Adam was hiding. When Samuel was asking Saul, what have you done? It's not because Samuel was wondering, I see smoke, I see a smell of uh, something burnt, what have you done? No, he knew. Such questions in the Bible are a call for us to own up to our sin and to repent of it. When God is asking you, what have you done? He's not asking you, give me information. It's a call for you to repent. It's a call for you to not only own up to your sin, like Pastor Eric helped us to see. It is a call for you to see your sin the way God sees your sin. God wants to see what you have done in the light of his word. And he wants you to repent from it. But then like our father Adam, instead of repenting of his sins and seeking the mercies of God, Saul does what? He shifts the blame. Right? When I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed. So he presumes on God. He offers a sacrifice that he wasn't um, to offer. He knows he has sinned. Instead of just saying, Samuel, I have sinned. I have just offered a burnt offering and a peace offering. I should have waited for you. Please pray to God for him to forgive me. Pray and ask God, please plead for me before God. The sin of presumption now becomes pride. It's not my fault, it's your fault. The reason I'm in this sin is because of your, your weakness. Your failure, Samuel, got me here. You did not come within the days appointed. Saul should have been patient. Saul should have waited. Even if Samuel had delayed and the Philistine army was at the doorstep, he should have waited. He should have been patient. should have just said, you know what, I can't offer. It is not in my place to offer this burnt offering. That even as my army is leaving, I'd rather be left with three people here as I wait for Samuel than sin against God. But in his presumption, taking up or doing something he is not supposed to do and thinking that God will accept it, he grows into a deeper sin. 
This is one of the signs of a hardened heart. When one not only refuses to repent or acknowledge their sins, but they blame others for their sin. Like Adam, he wants to blame his sins on, a, on the failures of others. Now, it is true that others or situations outside us can tempt us. But to sin or not to sin is our personal responsibility. Simply because Samuel has delayed doesn't give you the right to sin. Simply because you feel that God has delayed on something, it doesn't give you the right to sin. It doesn't give you the right to take matters into your own hand. I've been waiting for years for a husband or for a wife, and I'm not getting one. Let me just go and get, talk to the unbeliever in my office and let me live with them. And people will say, ah, but you see the situation. The situation allowed it. No one was talking to me in the church. It is their fault. Your sin is your sin. Yes, other people may tempt you. Yes, other people may fail. But your sin is your sin. That's a serious thing. It's a picture. It's actually a sign of hardening. If you are there in your spiritual life, God is convicting you of sin. If people are pointing you to your sin and you keep on pointing to others as to the reason why you are living in sin and wallowing in sin and swimming in sin, that's, that's some serious hardening. Cry out to God. Ask him to help you. Ask him to save you. The end is that God rejects him and his descendants from the throne of Israel forever. Look at those sad words. Like, I mean, this, this is the moment when you see now that kingdom that was going up take a nosedive, a serious nosedive. Look at this. Look at those words. Verse 13. You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God with, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom forever. And then look at this. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. I mean, those words must have been sharp. Reading this passage, having read it a number of times, I, I just look at them and I wonder, you know, if they were spoken to me, if I was soul at that time, I mean, this, this should crush a man. This should make you to fall down on your knees and cry. That God would say, I have rejected you. I have rejected your descendants. Not just you, your descendants. And I have even gone further. I have chosen another man to replace you. Those are sad words. Crushing words. And look at it. It is forever. When God says forever, it is sealed. It is not until your family gets their thing right. It is forever. This is a serious judgment. But as we look at the laws of this passage, here's the good news. That as this passage speaks about David 
being the man after God's own heart. David as the man who God will make king. This is a prediction of the coming great son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a pointer to Christ, the great king, who will fully please God. Who will please God in his life, in his obedience of God's commandments, who will even please God in his death. For we are told in the Bible, he was obedient even to the point of death in Philippians chapter 2. Christ was obedient even to death. No other king did this. It's only Christ. And this is why then we can come to this great king. It may be that you have fallen into such sin of pride and presumption. And you are in the depth of that sin. But here is hope. Repent. Turn to Christ. Look to this great king. Once you were condemned to eternal sin, I mean to eternal judgment, but now in Christ you have eternal life. This is the hope of the gospel. That in the king, this coming king, the king who will fully and truly please Christ, in him your sins can be forgiven. There is hope. There is hope even for you. There is hope for you who has fallen into the worst kind of sin, into the worst kind of pride, into the worst kind of presumption. But then thirdly and lastly, we see a kingdom that is in danger of fear and neglect, and danger, a kingdom that is ruled by fear and neglect. We, in the Bible, we see that the land of Israel was rich in iron and copper in a number of passages. There are a number of passages in the Bible that show that one of the things, one of the beautiful and good things about the promised land is that it was a land that was rich in iron and copper. It wasn't simply the land flowing with milk and honey. I think we all know that, eh? Land flowing with milk and honey. But the, do you know the Bible says that Israel is, or the promised land was a land of iron and copper? Look, just look at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 9. And see what God says about the promised land. A land, okay, so the promised land, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper. Israel was a wealthy nation that was able to harness the riches of this land, the copper and the iron, to make implements of war, to make swords, spears, chariots. The iron and the copper wasn't there for them to simply make jewelry or to make sufurias and all those other kinds of things. It was there for them to make implements of war that God had already supplied them with what they needed to defeat the Canaanites, to defeat the Philistines. But this wealth did not translate into exploitation or exploitation for the protection and advancement of the nation. Rather, in this chapter, we see a nation that was weakened and made to be dependent on, the, on an enemy nation. We are told in verse 19, 
Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout the land of Israel. Okay? And then we are told that, verse 20, but everyone of the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen his plow share, his mattock, his axe, and his sickle. Verse 22, so on the day of battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people with Saul or Jonathan, but Saul and Jonathan, his son, had them. What is happening here? No one has a sword in a land that is rich in iron and copper. No one has a spear. Actually, sadly enough, no one can even sharpen a djembe. For you to sharpen a djembe, you had to walk all the way, go to the Philistines, pay the Philistines, so that they sharpen your djembe, and then you come and then you plow the land. What is happening here? This is some serious neglect. That they had, God had given them all that they needed, but they neglected it. But we also see that they lived in fear. We are told that there was no blacksmith in the land, no one to form the iron and the copper into the tools and the instruments that were needed for war. Now, it happened that, or from what this, what this passage tells us, is that the Philistines had something to do with it. The Philistines had said, you know, lest the Hebrews, uh, lest the Hebrews make themselves swords and spears. So it seems that the Philistines either threatened or did not want or had a closed shop of all the blacksmiths. Some commentators say that after the defeat of Eli's sons in chapter 4, that the Philistines uh, put a severe embargo that no metalwork can be done in the land of Israel. Israel did have blacksmiths. Israel did have people who could work iron and work copper, but they were living in fear. They were living in fear of the Philistines. So it was a lifestyle of fear that was making them not do their duty. But it was expected that with the coming of Saul, that one of the things that ought to have been done is to reverse this, isn't it? You are now the king. This should be your first policy. You know how, like for example, uh, if you look at human history, um, for example with Germany and the, the rise of Hitler, one of the things that had happened to Germany after World War I is that they were told you cannot have an army that is big, that is powerful, that is well armed. But we see when Hitler came to power, what's the first thing that he did? He started to rearm Germany, isn't it? He started building an army. He started building um, aircrafts for war, artilleries, uh, bomb-making facilities, and all that kind of thing. And that was an evil man. How much more a man who is taking care of God's people? He has just been installed king. Should he have allowed this to continue? Should he, he have allowed his country to be disarmed? Matthew Henry puts it this way, that how unwise Saul was, that he did not in the beginning of his reign set himself to redress this grievance. Somewhere else, not doing it was very excusable. He fought with other artillery, thunder and lightning, in answer to his prayer. But for Saul to leave his soldiers without swords and spears and to take no care to provide for them 
especially when he might have done it out of the spoils of the Ammonite, whom he conquered in the beginning of his reign, was a piece of negligence that cannot be excused. They had just defeated the Ammonites, by the way, in chapter, is it chapter 11. All those swords that, and the spears that the Ammonites had, where did they go? He should have used that at least to supply his army. But it appears that some of these spoils of war were not in Israel. Had they been taken by the Philistines? Maybe. Had they been uh, taken by the Israelites to the Philistines for sharpening and maybe held there? Who knows? But the king should have done something. Israel should have done something. The author shows us a nation that was comfortable with the current situation. Out of fear, out of ease, they let things be. They were going down to the Philistines. They were okay, you know. Why should we do this job of sharpening our knives, our swords? The Philistines are doing it for us. Let's just be at ease. And neglect, dear brethren, is one of the things that leads to serious spiritual decline. That you can actually be living in a land that is full of iron, full of copper. That you can actually be part of a church where God's word is preached richly. That you can be part of a family where God's word is preached constantly. But yet in all that wealth, you are declining spiritually. That in all those blessings, you have never sought to explore them for your own spiritual good. It's sad. It's sad that God's word is preached every Sunday from this pulpit. It's sad that you are part of a Bible study. You are part of a book club. But then, look at your own spiritual life. You're declining. What's happening? You are not taking initiative to use that for the growth of your own life. Neglect. Out of fear and complacency, Israel did not want or did not work for the progress of the nation. They were fearful of the Philistines. What will the Philistines hear? If Saul has opened the blacksmith shop, because all that Saul needs to do is just to say, all blacksmiths from today open shop, start making swords, start making spears. But he's quiet about it. Fear. Because the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make themselves swords. In other words, Dare they do that? Fear causes paralysis. And paralysis leads to neglect. Where we are so afraid to move and act, even where God has commanded. And it leads to spiritual death. Some of the reasons why we do not obey the word of God, we give ourselves excuses. But I fear what will happen if I obey God on this? What will happen if I say, if I tell my boss I, will, I cannot sin against God? I'll lose my job. I'll be hungry. I'll be kicked out of my house. Fear. Well, if I preach the gospel, what will they think of me? Fear. Fear ultimately leads to neglect. This is why the Bible, uh, as people say, that the Bible has 365 fear not passages. There are so many fear not or do not fear or do not fear them or do not be afraid verses. Why does the Bible, why is the Bible so populated by these passages? 
because fear is one of our biggest enemies. It's one of the things that paralyzes us and causes us not to move forward, not to advance, not to exploit the things that God has given us. Now for us who are here, as we look at Israel, for the one who does not know Christ, there's a lot that you fear. Maybe you're asking yourself, if I repent of my sins, if I turn to Christ, what will happen to my reputation? What will my family say about me? I will lose my job, I will lose this or that. Or to the believer seated here, you're wondering, if I obey God in this one area, it will have consequences. For the unbeliever, this passage. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. If you're not in Christ, please don't fear those who can kill your body. Don't fear those who can starve your body. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear God only. Turn to Christ, repent, come to him. He will save you. He will take care of you. Even in death, he will take care of you. To the believer, God is our strength. This is why Christ before he ascended, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you to the end of the age. That's the promise Christ gave. Hang on that promise. Live in obedience. Live in submission to his words. And stand firm in the Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. We thank you for your word. Oh Lord, we have just seen a kingdom that rose and is in quick decline. We pray that you would help us to watch over our own hearts, that we would not allow ease with the enemy, that we would not go into presumption and pride, that we would not fear man which causes us to neglect our duty. Oh, help us, Lord. We pray for the unbeliever that they would fear you for your fear is the beginning of knowledge and understanding. May they turn to Christ. May they know him who is able to give them eternal life. We thank you and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.